It helped us win two world wars and has been used to take pretty much every type of big game here in North America. It is 30-06. Gavin, you're here from UltimateReloader.com. I'm here with Guy Miner from GMM Defense. You've seen Guy on the channel before. We're here to talk about 30-06 because Starline just introduced 30-06 brass into their lineup of rifle cartridges. And Guy, you started with Starline with pistol, is that correct? I sure did. 44 Magnum and then that uh, crazy 500. Yeah, yep, yep. yep. Used the Starline brass that. It was fantastic. And that's where I got started. But then a few years back, they started to roll out rifle cartridges, you know, 308, 223. I've had really good luck with 224 Valkyrie. It's pretty much my most accurate load, I would say. Brand new Starline brass, 70 grain RDF nozzler bullet and Varget powder. The thing just shoots absolutely amazing. It so, does, I hit the target with it. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> and really mild recoil to boot. I wanted to take this opportunity to kind of briefly lay out the chronology of 30-06, talk about why it's still such a popular rifle cartridge. Then maybe we could talk about some of the hunting success that you've had. Sure. We could talk about our own field results with this Starline 30-06 brass. And then I wanted to review some of the laboratory experiments that I've done and measurements that I've taken to quantify the consistency and the quality of the brass. So buckle up. We're going to tell this 30-06 story from a Starline perspective, and we're going to try and cover all of the basic bases. Let's start with the chronology. Developed in about... 1903-ish starting? 1906, there were some changes in there and then it got standardized before World War I. Yep, and which is why it has 30-06, it's 30 caliber and From it's of the year 1906. 1906. Put into service, adopted by the military, M1 Garant, semi-automatic. That came around for World War II, it was mm -hmm. the semi-auto, before then it was a Springfield bolt action and mm -hmm. the uh, model of 1917 bolt mm -hmm. action. Uh, Grand came out and was a serious, serious weapon for World War II. And that's one that I'd really like to have in my collection. And so Millsurp would definitely be one scenario where this would be an attractive brass option. Good quality, made in the USA at a very reasonable price and it's going to perform really well for those CCNR type rifles, World War II, World War I vintage stuff. Right. But of course, that's not the primary use for 30-06 in this day and age. Not anymore. Anymore, it's mostly thought of as a big game cartridge mm -hmm. and has been for a long time. And when I bought my first hunting rifle, it was this Savage Model 116, kind of a combo package with a, a Simmons 3-9 to scope, all weather, lightweight, something that you can take anywhere here we're in Washington State, doesn't matter if it gets wet. I figured, I talked to a whole bunch of people that knew a lot more about hunting than I did. Uh -huh. They said, just go with 30-06. It's so simple, it's a simple answer and it's rarely the <laughs> wrong answer. Yeah. Now there, there may be a better cartridge for this application or that application, but as kind of a do it all, mm -hmm. it's hard to beat. Tell us a little bit about your rifle and then we'll get into some of your hunting success. Sure. <laughs> Yeah, my rifle is a, uh, it's a Remington 700, the CDL version, which is a little slimmer stock than the BDLs. Um, keeps it relatively light. Uh, it's walnut stock, and then the blue finish at least. I'm not sure if that's actual blowing, but it sort of looks like it at any rate. <laughs> uh, I keep things simple with a six power scope on there. The rifle has been uh, pillar bedded. Uh, Mitch Rowland did that for me, did a nice job. And it's proven to be pretty accurate lightweight enough to carry on some big trips um, and I've had a lot of success with it in the field. And I think these two rifles represent kind of the sweet spot for 30-06. Yeah. You're going to be shooting out to maybe 400-ish yards right. probably at the most. You need knockdown power, you need something that's going to be pack friendly and yours has a 24-inch barrel, is that right? It does. Yep, mine's a 22-inch barrel. Okay. So a little bit of difference in form factor, but pretty much the same net result, right? Yeah, and most, most of your 30-06s uh, factory rifles are either a 22 or a 24 inch. Mm -hmm. There's some other ones that are oddballs, but those are the two mm -hmm. that are primary and, and they work great with, with the cartridge. Yep, and for hunting, what I think is a huge strong point 
and really helped to cement 30-06 as kind of the, the standard go-to round for big game is its versatility with different bullet weights. Yes, yes, it'll shoot fine with 150s, 165s, 180s, 200s, and it'll even mm -hmm. handle the big 220s. Yep. You know, it just depends on what you want to do with your rifle. Yeah, so tying that back, l tell me a little bit about game that you've taken with 30-06. Let's hear a couple of the stories because you've taken a, a variety of games. I, I have, and it's been it's been nice. Uh, I had been a, a user of the 30 out six a long time ago, kind of got away from it, and then in uh, 2016 I said, you know what, I'm going to do it all with the 30 out six again and with one load, uh, 100, <laughs> 165 grain Nosler ballistic tip, mm -hmm. um, and that year I started out with a bear here in Washington State at about 325 yards, one shot, down and done. One. And the bear that we have here are black bear. Black bears, right? yep. The it's a good sized black bear. Brown bears typically are up more closer to Canada and north of there. Occasionally you'll see one wander down, but yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, usually, yeah. Uh, so a good healthy black bear. Yeah, big black bear, um, roughly six foot squared. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, one shot, and he bent about 10, 12 feet. And that mm -hmm. was it after the shot. Uh, found the bullet jacket on the offside hide after it penetrated through quite a bit of bear and the uh, lead core had vanished outside the bear and nice exit wound and he didn't go anywhere. That was mm -hmm. good. Uh, that was here in Washington. Headed back to Wyoming, hunt mule deer and uh, pronghorn antelope. Mm -hmm. uh, mule deer was a fairly close shot, about 140 yards and he was facing facing head on to me and I was not going to get any other shot. So mm -hmm. I took it, not my favorite shot. Uh, he did require a finishing shot, but that first shot dropped him like that and he'd never moved again. So that was good. Uh, I had to, did have to finish him when I got up to him. The last thing you want is for an animal to run away into the bushes and die alone and you can't Wounded use and, the animal. And, or yeah. Maybe, yeah, maybe never find it, who yep. knows. So I love the, you know, being able to drop it just, yeah. just like that. Um, Antelope. Antelope was uh, easy peasy. I don't know what this antelope was thinking of, a buck. Uh, <laughs> he had to see me and he was crossing from right to left about 250 yards away and uh, I said, okay, well fine, I've got an antelope tag, that works for me. Mm -hmm. um, one shot and obviously the OT6 with that much bullet is way more than you need for an antelope, mm -hmm. but it worked really well. Uh, he went down, didn't move anywhere. Uh, that was I think very nice and neat and clean. Hunting bullets and hunting cartridges the way I think of trucks. I'd rather have a diesel one-ton truck towing a utility trailer than to have a half-ton truck pulling a large travel trailer, There was if nothing, that makes sense. <laughs> there, was, there was nothing wrong with having a 30 hot six for the antelope. Yeah. yeah, you could do it with something a lot less, sure. but it worked great. Yep, but it's nice not to have to worry, right, about yep. that. <laughs> and then I had a late season cow elk tag here mm -hmm. in Washington and uh, 338 yard shot, one shot through the shoulder blade into the boiler room, hmm. down she went. So, you know, four animals, five shots if I include hmm. the one finisher for the, the buck. Mm -hmm. um, ranges from 140 to 340 yards basically. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, all with this rifle, all with one single load, 165 grain bullet. Right. Um, then I bumped up the bullet a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, 200 grain Nosler partition, slowed the velocity down, of course, took it to Alaska and um, got myself a wolf and a grizzly bear. Wow. <laughs> um, and the grizzly, that was a monster, right? It was a big bear. This was a barren ground grizzly. It was up in the Brooks Range. Mm -hmm. uh, we were camped up there for uh, nine days, uh, well above mm -hmm. the Arctic Circle. Um, seventh day of the hunt, I almost thought I wasn't going to get a bear. We mm -hmm. finally found a bear, and after a long stalk, there he is at 40 yards. I admit, I missed him the first shot. <laughs> um, <laughs> might have been a little excited. Mm -hmm. And then I hit him the second, third, and fourth shots. Um, he went down, he got up, he went down again. Um, <laughs> I was about to reload. The, uh, my lone rifle and the guide handed me his rifle and said just finish him. The bear was down, but mm -hmm. yeah, it was, that was exciting. Um, was the OT6 enough? Sure it was enough. And maybe if I'd planted that first round in there a little better, yeah. maybe it wouldn't have needed the next two or three. Yeah, you know, I've, I've found that with discussions around things like using 6.5 Creedmoor for elk. Mm -hmm. Absolutely 
big enough, absolutely powerful enough if you have the right circumstances and the right shot placement. Right. You know, so sometimes it comes down to a cartridge like 30 out six gives you a little bit more leeway, perhaps. Maybe, yeah. Shot, <laughs> shot placement is, is really is almost everything. You've got to yep. have a decent bullet, but yeah, you know, but it was nice to know that the good old 30 out six did all that for me in the space of a few months. Yep. Had the fall season, and then a few months later had the spring grizzly hunt up in Alaska. Mm -hmm. And uh, the rifle came through. Yeah. No problem. You can yeah. spend more money on a rifle every year and have to have the latest and greatest, or you can fall back to the old standard, right, that grandpa and great grandpa used to use, 30 out 6. <laughs> Do not tell my wife that I only need this rifle, please. <laughs> okay. Okay. We won't mention that. <laughs> no. <laughs> there, there happen to be a couple of other hunting rifles, but this one is my, you know, it's my favorite. It's my baseline. If I'm going to go hunting, uh, for anything, you know, any kind of big game critter, mm -hmm. this is the first thought that comes to mind. It's always sighted in. I've always got ammo for it, and I know it will do the job. It's a classic as well. It, and it's, yeah, it is. It's old classic, school, it's classic hunting rifle. He looks at the man with gray hair and says, old school. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, now you guys know why I wanted to bring Guy into this video is because, you know, to have that type of diversity of results, even from one load, is particularly impressive you know i've hiked with my 30-06 a lot i've never harvested anything with it so i didn't want to try and speak as a uh, seasoned expert with 30-06 in terms of kill you know I've we're going to change, uh, change that yeah well gonna... i got so many cartridges to hunt with what do you guys think i should do please drop a comment <laughs> okay so we've talked about the loads yeah. what guy and i did was guy took some of this brass home and he loaded it at home in his, his reloading room I did a few loads to do sort of expansion testing, once fired brass testing for the water capacity test, which I'll get to in just a moment. Uh, but we did have the opportunity earlier today to go out and shoot some of this ammo. And I think the it's results fun. that we found were pretty interesting. This was about what kind of velocity and consistent velocity are we getting? And can we ring the steel and not obsess about groups because that's really not what this story is about. We all know what 30 out six is capable of, but when you're talking about a 400 yard hunting cartridge, it's not about getting quarter inch groups. No, you you don't have to have quarter merit of angle right. accuracy on these things. Uh, is it is it desirable? Of course. Yes, um, but we will save that for the other stories like 308 or 65 Creedmoor or six millimeter Creedmoor. I'll spend days preparing that data. This story has been fun because we can talk about real results like the animals that you've harvested in, and then take a look at the loads and see that how they perform. And this time with Starline Brass. So let's start with, mm -hmm. you did a string of five shots with your pet load, I would call it. Yep. The 165 Nosler ballistic tips. We had five shots. We had an average velocity of 2935, which is cooking. Yes. For, yeah. That's it, a lot of people think the old 30 out six is some you know slow 2,000 foot per second thing. It's it's not pushing almost 3,000 feet per mm -hmm. second out of it. Yep. At published loads. Mm -hmm. Okay. Got got those out of the. This is a know, max load. Got the, right. I, I consider it a max load. Absolutely. Yeah. I don't. Yeah. I don't want to go any faster than that. 2,930 yep. some odd feet per second. That's that's plenty. Disclaimer on all of this always consult manufacturers published load data and yes. not just one source but two even if it's something that's slightly different you want to have that that double check to make sure that you're in the right ballpark and that you're in the right pressure range always start below and work your way up to max charges here's what was impressive to me about that that string of five that you shot an sd a standard deviation on velocity of 8.7 feet per second gets you up into that match class of quality load that you've developed. So with this, you've got a really good performing bullet, mm -hmm. you've got excellent velocity, and you've got a tight spread on your velocity. Yeah. So, and you were just saying, I'm kind of going to stick with this load because once you find the load, you know, you'd have to have a good reason to change. <laughs> I've got hundreds and hundreds of those bullets at home because mm -hmm. I know I'm just going to stick with that and I've got pounds and pounds of the powder. Yep. Um, H4350? That's H4350. That's yep. my go-to powder for the 30 out 6 Has been for many years. There's other good powders for it. That's my favorite. Yep. 
Okay, so then we move to the Hornady 178 grain ELDX. Yes. I've had good luck with ELDX. I took a Black Bear last year with a 6.5 Creedmoor 143 ELDX, and this year I took a Mule Deer Buck with the 300 PRC and the 212 ELDX. We thought it would be fun for 30-06 to take a look at the 178 ELDX, because that's kind of right in the sweet spot of the hunting bullet weight range, I would say. It is. Uh, you know, the, the 180 is a classic weight, bullet weight for the 30-06. This 178 is playing right into that. Uh, I noticed when I first opened up that box of 178s how long that mm -hmm. bullet is. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a long, tapered, obviously a long-range bullet. Yeah. And that's where this bullet really shines. As we were looking at the G1BC was 0.55 something or something, something like, like that. that. Yeah. And uh, look into the article for the full specs, but that is significantly higher. So if you are thinking about long range hunting with 30 out six, and there's no reason that you shouldn't. It would work fine. Especially if you have a really quality built rifle. Yes. You're very comfortable with your shooting circumstances and you're practiced up with the rifle and you've developed mm -hmm. a good load, there's no reason that you wouldn't. This would be potentially a really good bullet to use for that. We did two different load levels, 54 grains and 55 grains. Right. And we're working up to that max load and I think what was interesting there was the average velocity went from 2710 up to 2773 where the standard deviation on velocity went from 27.7 down to 9.6. 9.6 was impressive. And so I think what you're doing is you're getting into a velocity node there. And that's so, real close to the published max load in yep. Hornady's book, I think within three tenths of a grain or something. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and you are. You're getting, you're getting that part where you start getting up there close to your max load and accuracy and the SD and all that stuff starts looking great. So what would be a good follow-on to that would be to take some charge weights near there mm -hmm. and then start shooting some groups and to see where you get that good intersection of a low SD and a tight group. So I would call that like an optimal charge weight kind of follow-up. Right. Yeah. Right. So that was interesting. Uh, and so that might be a good bullet if you're interested in hunting with the, the 30 out 6 Okay, the 200 grain Nosler partition had 53 grains of H4350, and the average velocity there was 2572, which for that bullet weight is a significant amount of energy. Yeah, yeah, you can get it up over 2600, and there's actually, there's a, a powder, uh, H4831 actually is probably going to get you close to another 100 feet per second. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's uh, really impressive. Is that I, slower burning then? I'd have to look on the chart uh, yeah, to know is. for sure. Yeah, it is, okay. and, and mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's a really good alternative for those heavier bullets, I just stuck with H4350. Mm -hmm. I had it, um, it shot great, yeah, why not? Good for you having it. It can be unobtainium in some years. <sighs> Terrible. So Terrible. when you get the, the chance to stock up on that powder that you love, definitely, definitely do so. And this was the load, was it, that you used to take the bird? That was the grizzly load, yeah. yep. So <laughs> there you go. Yeah. <laughs> nice. And for my load, I wanted to complement the whole hunting thing with 168 grain match bullets. So I used the Hornady 168 grain HPBT because I feel like that's kind of for shooting accuracy and match shooting type of scenarios kind of in the in the middle sweet spot range. And I got, so I, ha I was downloaded a little bit. I wasn't up towards max. This was really a load that I just used to fire form the cases for, for the water capacity mm -hmm. tests. So I only had 49 and a half grains of Varget behind that 168 HPBT. And I was, in the colder weather, I was averaged, averaging 2694. But in the shop, when I shot the yeah. shots through the chronograph out the window, it was over 2700. For four shots, I had one error. For four shots, it was 2704. A little so difference. I think the temperature was probably you know, the factor there. But my SD was up at 15.2. So again, mm -hmm. I'm expecting I would need to go through a workup on that to get that down and to look at accuracy. It'd be interesting to see where that goes. I've never used Varget in the 30-06. Mm -hmm. I've used it extensively in the 308. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a couple of different nodes with the 308. I wouldn't be at all surprised there's a there's a good node with Varget and the 30-06 too. And you're right about the 168, 165, 168. Those are great bullet weights for the 06 mm -hmm. or the 308. Yep. 
Yeah. And I know from prior experience with my Savage 116 that if I monitor barrel temperature and I'm very careful about my shooting technique, it's gotten a, a three shot group probably on the order of under 0.4. Wow, and nice. So I've since exclusively done five shot groups since then. So I'm, I'm expecting with some low development, it would be around in the half MOA range maybe for five shots. That's impressive. Yeah. Maybe yeah. Lightweight hunting rifle like that. Yep. Yeah, sporter rifle. Takes a lot of concentration on shooting technique. <laughs> it does. They, they tend to jump around a little yep. bit. Not, not like our heavy barreled match guns. Yeah, so I found the brass to load really good. The primer pockets had really good positive priming action. It felt like they were tight enough, but not too tight. I've had some brass lately where it's really difficult to prime. Interesting. Because of super tight primer pockets, which is something you might want if you're in one of those really hot Wildcat cartridges where you get pressure problems and primer pocket blowups or whatever. But uh, my brass loaded really well. And what I'd like to do now is maybe transition to some of that testing data that I talked about. Because in these tested stories, I really want to make sure that we have these anecdotal stories to share and real world results, mm -hmm. but we also have the data to back up you know, the evaluation of a particular product. So for the Starline brass, this is the first time I've done a tested story on a particular brass cartridge. And I thought what I would do is focus on case capacity. Mm -hmm. I just got all set up to do the grains of water with a syringe and that kind of thing. Look at the length, look at weight variation of the brass itself, and then also take a look at case neck thickness uniformity. Of those, probably the least critical is the overall length consistency. But it's another measure of the consistency of the manufacturing process. Right, right. Good indicator of quality, I think. Yeah. Or at least one indicator. Yep. Absolutely. So on the case length, I used digital calipers, six inch digital, digital calipers that are accurate to about a half of a thousand. So keep that in mind. I took 10 pieces of brass, in fact, this very set of 10 right here, and ran them through all these tests. So for the first test, which was the overall length of the case, the standard deviation was six tenths of a, thousand, of a thousandth of an inch, 0 0.0006. The extreme spread was only a thousandth and a half. That's Tight. really good. <laughs> and the average length was 2.4856 inches. And while we're on measures for, for dimensions, the case neck thickness uniformity, I used a ball micrometer and I took four different points around the circumference of the case mouth. And so I took two opposite each other and then rotate 90 degrees, two opposite each other. So one, one every 90 degrees. And then I looked at the standard deviation, extreme spread, and average for those. The average is important when you're talking about neck bushings mm -hmm. and things like that where you want a certain amount of spring back. And so those numbers netted out to a standard deviation uh, 0 0.00037 for the case neck thickness uniformity. So about four tenths of a thousandth of an inch, if you want to think of it that way. One thousandth of an inch of variation would be maybe something like that you'd find on Millsurp brass, a approximately in that range. So this is significantly, significantly better than that. The extreme spread on the whole lot was only 1.4 thousandths of an inch. So if you look at all of the data, that's the total variance between the very minimum dimension out of all of those and the very maximum dimension. And the average was 12.9 thousandths of an inch for, for the thickness. So I actually feel really good about that. I feel like that's a good tight number. I wouldn't see a need necessarily to turn necks or anything like that unless you're going way out into the weeds. Especially not <laughs> for hunting loads. So yeah. we'll use it normal hunting yep. ranges. What was funny is I knew that Gavin was gonna take all these incredible measurements and stuff. <laughs> I'm, I'm not that reloader. Um, I picked it up out of the box, looked at it, said this looks like great brass and loaded some ammo. So yeah. Thank you for measuring it, <laughs> yeah. because I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's one way that we can non-subjectively compare one particular product to another, and of course that could vary by lot as well. So all, all of these variables, you know, I'm doing my best to quantify this stuff, but there's yes. still some things that you gotta, you gotta account for. Okay, for, for water capacity, 
Water capacity for a case is measured by how much, how many grains of water will basically fit in when the water surface is perfectly flush with the case mouth. And I didn't trim these or anything. I did compare one brand new case out of the box with five that I had fire formed in the Savage 116. So the theory is the chamber is larger than the brass. Mm -hmm. When you fire form brass, it enlarges slightly, so yep. the water capacity should increase slightly. The SAMI spec for 30-06 is 68 grains of water. Okay. And the new case that I measured was 68.18, so it was 0.18 off. I'd say grains. that's pretty close. That's extremely close. That says the thickness of the brass and the dimensions are exactly what they should be. For the fired cases, the standard deviation or the variance statistically accounted for is 0.44 grains. That is also very tight. <laughs> the average was 69.53 grains and the extreme spread was one grain. So what did we get? We got 1.5 grains of additional water capacity by fire forming those cases. Sounds, sounds what I would expect. We'd get a lot more than that with a Mosin Nagant, I know that. <laughs> because those Mosin chambers are really, really loose and the brass enlarges quite a bit. In fact, maybe I will test that because I think I have some Lapua 764 by 53R. 762 by 53R? Yeah. <laughs> Mosin Nagant? 54R? 54R, thank 54 you. 54R. Yes. That was the enemy cartridge. True. Sorry, I was a Marine. Kind of like 30-06, though. I am a Marine. Overall, overall except for image, <laughs> right? Yes. Actually, very similar power, too. Yep. Very similar. Right in there with 308, 30-06. Yep. Yeah. So that is our initial set of data. Of course, you can refer to the full article. Check the link in the video description if you want to completely review all of the individual numbers, which I will provide. And this being the first of this tested series on brass, I don't really have anything to compare it to directly. I'm gonna have to put more brass through this testing process in order to s compare one to another. Yeah, you know, I take some of your other cartridges that you play with, uh, do the same doggone thing with mm -hmm. them, and we can stack up and get it to kind of some measurements to give you an indicator of the overall quality of it. Yep. Uh, what might work better for long range hunting or target shooting. Mm -hmm. Um, and what might be just peachy keen for somebody who's going to shoot a deer at 200 yards. Mm -hmm. so. Sounds like a good plan. So, what do you think? Please leave, leave a comment. Are you going to hunt with 30-06 or do you hunt with 30-06? Leave a comment and tell us why. Do you not hunt with 30-06? Leave a comment and tell us why you prefer a different cartridge. This is all a part of the discussion. And Guy, I really appreciate you coming by and being a part of things and sharing with us your own personal hunting stories because that's a really great way to evaluate how good this cartridge is for hunting. <laughs> Thanks, it, it's, it's a good one. I've yeah. hunted with a lot of different cartridges and uh, looking back on it, dad told me over 50 years ago that the only rifle I would ever need is a 30 out mm -hmm. six and I spent a lot of money on other guns. He was right. He was right. Tried and true. If you want to get your own Starline 30-06 brass, go to starlinebrass.com, click on rifle, and you get right to it. And make sure you subscribe because I've got more tested stories coming up. I've got more mm -hmm. loading, more hunting, all of this stuff. Make sure you click on that little bell so that you get the notifications. If you liked this video, please give it a thumbs up. Until next time, happy shooting and happy reloading.